Hello everyone, uh, this is yet another episode of Career Talks and today we'll be talking about careers in medical writing, how to bec become a medical writer, what is this uh, field, uh, is it as hermetic as some people say, and how does the uh, uh, daily life of a medical writer look? Let's see. If you guys like this channel, please subscribe and leave your comments and questions below. And I commit myself to answer all your questions. So it's a free care advice. If it's free, why not take it? And today I have great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Ayaka Ando to you. And Ayaka is my, is my friend and we used to work together in the same Student Council of Organization for Human Brain Mapping. So we know each other very well. Ayaka completed her PhD in the field of neuroscience and neuroimaging at the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health, University of Melbourne, and University of Queensland, Australia. She then moved to Germany to pursue her career in academia, where she was appointed a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, Heidelberg University, Germany. During this time, she also had the privilege of serving as the chair of the International Council of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Student and Postdoc Special Interest Group. Through her experiences, she acquired a taste for science communication and community outreach, and now she works as a medical writer uh, for a medical communications company. Aika was born in Japan, but has mo spent most of her life living in the land of koalas and kangaroos, aka Australia. She is now happy uh, to have ha found a nice home in Heidelberg, Germany. Thank you so much, Ayaka, for uh, accepting the invitation. And I'm curious to hear about your career told from your own perspective. Not a problem. Thank you so much for inviting me. So I guess my career started off, well, my career, not, I'm probably going to start with my life, how it began. I was born in Japan. Uh, however, I moved to Australia when I was maybe six and a half and grew up in Australia, as you can probably tell from my accent. Um, yes, yeah, so that's where I actually call home. I grew up in a very beachy city called the Gold Coast, actually, but I'm probably the only Australian that you would ever know that's never surfed embarrassingly. <laughs> um, and then I actually moved to Melbourne to do my university and my undergrad and did my honours there as well in neuroimaging. So that's where I actually started my career in academia. Uh, and I loved living there. I loved the research. I loved the human aspect of neuroimaging as well as the, you know, the technical aspect as well. And I really enjoyed it. So I, but after, before I did my PhD, I did work as a research assistant for a year, which I think is quite a common, you know, common way to do it, uh, to just discover some new labs and some other labs and, you know, other research methods. So that's what I did. But I did end up going back to actually my, where I did my honours to do my PhD, uh, which was also in neuroimaging, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think I ended up spending probably about 10 years of my life in Melbourne because it's actually a beautiful city and I would recommend anyone to go, <laughs> even though it's pretty far from where we are now. Uh, and then uh, that's where I actually met my now husband who is German and that's probably why, as corny as it sounds, that's probably why we moved to Germany to live now, which is where, I, uh, where, where I'm working at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, so I hear actually it was probably a risky move because we moved here and I was just on my tourist visa where I, when I was looking for my first, first job uh, here in Germany. But luckily I did find a postdoc position here uh, within my tourist within my time where my tourist visa was valid. So luckily that happened. And I worked here at the university clinic uh, doing research on child and adolescent psychiatry, where uh, still obviously doing neuroimaging because that's what I was interested in. And then um, that's also where, I guess, not, not exactly where I met you, but we were doing organization for human brain mapping, uh, student and postdoc special interest group that uh, during that time of my postdoc, which was actually a very good eye opener for me. And that's probably where it led, how I actually realized what I, how I want to transition, I guess, into out, out from academia and into medical communications and 
outreach. Uh, and that's why that's where I am now, I guess. In Welcome Solutions, we help highly educated professionals with navigating towards their dream careers. We offer intensive career rotation courses, combining self-discovery with practical information about the job market. We also work on our own educational materials, such as books and self-navigation manuals. Our new tool, the Odyssey Test, will help you discover what your natural way of creating value in the job market is and which working environment will fit you best. If you'd like to stay in touch with us and receive monthly updates, please subscribe to the newsletter. I worked, I think, as a postdoc in Germany for maybe three and a half years. And then I uh, went on parental leave, actually. And during my parental leave time, I transitioned into medical communications. So that's where I am now. Okay, great. Um, perfect. Um, so indeed, I, as mentioned before, we met each other uh, in the uh, in the student board of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I remember these times, like, like these were my favorite times after after I left uh, my contract, uh, my PhD contract. Yeah. And, it uh, was a great time. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a great time. Also, um, perhaps one, one reason was that we were all volunteering. So yeah. it was a charity work. So there was no pressure uh, that, you know, you sell your time for for a paycheck so mm -hmm. well you only donate your time so i think it feels different when you when you work this way uh, but also uh, it was a, a bit of a self-organizing group um, and i remember your style of management was more like a le less fair uh, style um, and um, but i i thought you were a good like leader natural leader so I was also surprised to uh, to find out that you uh, chose a career in medical uh, communication. Medical communication. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a quite a support role, right? Medical yeah. communication. But I mean, first of all, thanks for saying that I was a nice leader. <laughs> I'm happy to hear. But I think I was also. I think what led me to it is because I, you know, I think maybe what made me a good leader. Thank you. Like thanks for the humble comment but I think what led me to be one is that I like to be organized first of all and additionally I didn't mind that I like for me what was important is that the team functioned really well and that we were collaborative and that there was a nice atmosphere so that people were willing to be passionately working on the project rather than that I wanted to lead them so I think that that was my aims. I really wanted to create a nice environment. And I think that's that's what I still do in a way. And I don't care if I'm leading or if I'm, you know, supporting. It's just that if it's a nice environment that is created and if people are willing to do their things, then I think that's for me what's most important in a workplace. Like for me, the more important is not actually the work itself, but the people. And I think that's really how I let, I mean, obviously you have to be passionate about what you're doing, obviously, but for me, what's important is also the people. So that's how I think that our team then worked really well together as well. Right. Yeah. Well, that's uh, interesting. Uh, then you probably would be a contributor like uh, in the Odyssey. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. I think I am, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would, I would be curious uh, if you would take the test, like what would come out? Just like I have a clear hypothesis, so. <laughs> I yeah, I think I said yeah. I think I, I would be a, like a contributor, and only I would lead if that's the necessary skill in the group. I would, I would happily do it, but it's ra I'm rather a con contributor slash supporter. I think. Well, I thought you you are uh, you 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 have these leadership skills. It's just that. You make people feel that they take decisions for themselves and that it's their, you know, it's their idea <laughs> to, yeah. to go for tasks. Uh, so yeah. um, you don't really ever give that feeling to people that they are managed. Uh, yeah. They are managed yeah. in some way. They are organized and they are managed. It's just that they don't really, um, yeah, feel that on their skin. That's uh, and I think that's really skillful of a of a leader to do. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's uh, really nice to hear from someone who you know we worked t quite closely together for two years with. <laughs> right, right. Uh, no, I think you know. I also, um, I myself, uh, I don't really uh, enjoy being managed normally. So mm -hmm. that's also why I started my own company. And you were one of the exceptions, <laughs> together with <laughs> who was the, who was the chairperson before you. 
yeah. uh, you 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 guys were exceptions. So um, one of the very few uh, leaders that I I was actually following. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. And it's yeah, also a I good hope... example. It's a good example because also there is a lot of debate if female leaders are actually healthy or or they are toxic to their you know uh, also to their female mm. uh, like employees or you mm. know uh, like in this case i was not your employee but i was your team team member yeah, yeah. so there is um there is a lot of discussion how the like the culture and atmosphere in um in teams led by women uh yeah. look, looks and if it's healthy and i think in this case it was the most healthy team <laughs> i've ever worked for so yeah i mean i think it's not I, for me it's not probably the the person like the woman or like man per se but rather the person and the, their motive or like what their underlying like how how that person is like maybe if that person is competitive then maybe they would naturally just like you know subconsciously create a competitive environment potentially or maybe if they're, they're like quite controlling then maybe it's not really the woman or the 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 man per se i think but the the how the style of that person is and i think what i try to do really is that i, I quite learned learned quite a lot too and um you know it's, it's uh it's more so the that what i was trying to create really was that i really realized that different people need different guidance in a way right so then i think for you it was very clear that you were creative you had your ideas and you were really you know wanting to go for it so then why would you stop that right if you if you were if you were like you know if you were going for it then what what's the point of uh, managing that in a micro you know like micromanaging that i thought so i think yeah you, you were motivated enough then just go for it i think so i mean i'm glad we worked out very well because i think we made a very good team and that we uh really um yeah had a really successful congress then. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm a type of a creator. That's uh, that's uh, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, but I mean, not every leader understands this. So yeah, yeah. That's also the point. Um, okay. Well, so I'm glad to hear that you uh, also enjoy the role you uh, you have today, and I would like to uh, learn a bit more about the field of medical communications, as also there are lots of uh, urban legends. <laughs> Around <laughs> is that <laughs> okay i would like to know it's quite hermetic uh, at least here in the netherlands it is quite hermetic it's hard to get in um well it's also partially because it's hard to get in if you don't speak uh, the local language so yeah actually for expat phds it's, it's very hard to find the first job in this field but um could you um uh, tell us a bit more how the day daily job looks in uh like for you yeah right? sure a day of a, in a medical communications role so usually so we are very time orientated because we have you know we work within billable hours so we have to be very conscious of how we use our time and how we manage our time and also be efficient with it uh, because we also don't want to you know overcharge undercharge uh, so I think you work quite efficiently and very, it's very team orientated and everyone is very conscious about their capacity. And the good thing, the great thing is that because it's teamwork, it's really, you know, when someone can't, don't have that capacity because their deadline for something else is, you know, is coming, then someone else would pick it up. And as medical writers, I think people write really good briefs of what they have to do and it's really organized. So, you know, we, we know where to find things, we know how to continue. So I think that's the great thing about, um, about medical communication. I think generally people are very organized. But so what I think a general day would be that you have to attend a few meetings. It could be internal, um, a lot of them also external to talk about projects and uh, additionally a lot of the things that I personally do is uh, making congress um, 
Congress abstracts and posters as well as oral presentations. Um, how there's also I also work on um, ad boards sometimes as well, so ad advisory boards for pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we also work on obviously manuscripts, uh, ma writing manuscripts. But it's not only actually the doing part, but also the communicating to your clients part that is quite a majority of the job and, you know, um, being very neutral within that, within, within, within the whole project, I guess, um, and being the re relationship person between the authors and the client, for example. So it's it's quite a lot of that as well, which I find interesting, but it, I think it also takes a while to get to know the politics behind it as well. Um, yeah, but I guess a typical day would consist of dealing with actually many projects. Um, <laughs> and so you have to also you know, not only time managed, but also be organized and, you know, be able to quite switch your head because you might get some email to do something quite quickly for a client and you do have to do it then. So that's probably a typical day. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I only just mentioned briefly the Congress reports and ad advisory reports that I work on and manuscripts, but there's a lot of different uh, type of medical communication um, type types, I guess. There's, you know, people who write clinical trial reports, as well as people who do independent um, projects with, you know, not non-pharmaceutical clients. We also work with a lot of educational materials. So yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting job because you get a variety of indications as well as the, a variety of um, types of communication methods, I guess. Very interesting. So, um... I, I presume that that also requires salesmanship skills, isn't isn't it true? Because uh, yeah. if you communicate with clients, I guess one of the KPIs for for you as an employee is also the deals you make. Or I, I don't I don't know. I'm just making presumptions. Hmm. Here. Um, yeah, no, I, you're absolutely right. It's a, it is very client based. Um, however, luckily at our company we do have an account management role. So pe people who are more involved in the budgets and the you know organizing the the business side of things and i'm more involved in the scientific content side so luckily i'm not too involved i mean that's the good thing though we always are in constant communication to each other and we work together closely so we always know what's up except we don't have to you know organize it and i think that's how that's why it also works quite well when in you know compared to academia in academia, literally one person has to do all of these things, I think, you know, and I think whereas in industry, people who are good at that does that and people who can write does this and people who can project manage does that, you know, it's so it's because we are shared in the way where, you know, we blossom the most. I think that's also why it's it's organized first of all and we if we're not trained then we can ask someone who is trained in that in that respect so yeah that's i think that's why um not, not like you know not not saying that academia is bad you learn a lot and you sometimes just put in the deep end and you just have to really you know do it yourself um but i think in industry that's a little bit different because there's usually always someone you can ask uh, in academia as well but there's someone more professional not professional, but has more experience than you, that you can always refer to and you can always ask for support. And it's not just on you really to, um, you know, do all of the parts. Uh, what is the biggest challenge? Mm, the hardest to learn was maybe, well, first of all, it's, you know, when you're in academia, you're actually really concentrated on a very small part of research right you're really you are such a pro on that one particular thing um however when you go into industry i think you have to have a more broad knowledge of a lot of things and that's maybe that's one of the it's not it's i guess it's a challenge that was also interesting because you learn something new and i'm still learning something new 
you know, every day. Um, in, in academia, you do as well. But it's, it's, that was also, like, it was a difference, I guess. Um, I suddenly wasn't in this, you know, little bubble of neuroimaging, but suddenly I was working with um, many new indications, many pharmaceutical products. You know, it, it was like a little bit of a, you know, it was a bit different, <laughs> I must say. So that probably was, um, was a little bit of a challenge just the yeah and but what I really like also is the um that it's so easy to ask someone if you don't know something and that's that's what they said as well at the company that you know it's like first of all maybe do just ask someone because that's probably the best you know, the easiest, the fastest way you can get an answer. And if you, if they don't know, then you can always, you know, search for it, for it yourself. So they have a very open atmosphere where you really feel comfortable to ask people. So I think that also the challenge is also, you know, alleviated in a way by uh, being able to refer to people. Right. So, yeah. um, so how does your career path look like uh, in this environment? Well, I guess I'm an associate medical writer at the moment. So then you, you become like the, the, the actual medical writer and then you, there's like senior and then you go up, up and up and up. Uh, but you can also do sort of um, like a sideways transfer in a way where you uh, go to maybe account management, management roles as well. Um, but within the, if you would like, if that's what you're interested in. But I think what... Uh, what we do is like you when when you start you also do a variety a lot of variety of different types of projects and you also then realize what you first of all what you like and second of all what you are good at so then i think you really then you can sort of f nourish that uh that skill set in a way and they're also open to you saying you know i i actually want to try something new can i work on an a next an advisory board instead of working on congress reports or something like that so it's quite a um fluid uh environment i must say but yeah in terms of in terms of like direct career path i guess you would you would go you would be doing similar things but i think also because we do billable hours your time would cost more as as you get more senior in the role mm -hmm. yeah and um and when you're in this role um do you also feel that you have some uh, pressure to brand yourself next to working for your employer so what i mean is um, today in many fields uh, professionals feel uh, compelled to also um, uh, build a personal brand next to their job. So build their personal website, build a LinkedIn presence. Uh, so that also becomes a part of a career development uh, more and more so. Um, and, but it's not always, uh, not always the case. So um, do, you, uh, do you feel that next to your daily activities, you still have to uh, do a little bit of hustle on the side to kind of build your brand as a professional or this is uh, not not what's uh, like professionals in your field are doing not really i think um that's a really good question i think i haven't felt i think i felt more pressure while i was in academia because then you're really sort of I can't, maybe I shouldn't say left on your own, but you're sort of are in a way, right? You know, you have to find your own money and you have to find your own idea. You have to have your own ideas and projects and that has to be funded. Whereas here, I feel like I am fairly protected within the company in a way that uh, it's you represent them to clients too. So it's not my me. So I, I, I guess if I make a mistake, I feel bad for the team rather than myself um that i maybe represented them in the most not the best way for example so i don't have too much i i have never felt a, a bit of a too much pressure really actually to build any presence otherwise actually yeah right interesting uh, well uh, uh yeah that's interesting and and that's also what um often happens in it and i can see that uh, 
friends from like masters who are now in like working fa- Facebook and some other resp- reputable yeah. companies in IT and they kind of build their um, really good careers. Uh, they don't almost don't have any online presence. So now mm. I think it, like becomes two groups of professionals. Some of them go really hard on online present and try to mm-hmm. build as much following as possible. And, and and the rest just uh, is almost absent uh, online. And and I'm always wondering like, what is the best strategy? Like how to best allocate your time? Because you yeah. the day only has 24 hours. Like in my case, if I actually, what I want to do for a living is mostly writing books and creating materials and tools for other people to drive with their careers and potentially in the in the future also solve other types of problems but i want to be a problem solver create create new uh, new tools so deep work is what i kind of want to do for a living but of course this type of activity requires online presence because yeah when you start from scratch no one will buy ever buy your book when they don't know about you like that's also what i uh, learned the hard way <laughs> I, I, I wrote a book, I was very proud of it. I put it on Amazon and then uh, in the first like week or two, maybe um, 100 euro worth of books were sold. And I was like, hey, <laughs> like, <laughs> awesome. why doesn't it sell, right? And then, uh, and then I discovered that uh, like what you do is not everything. You also have to have ways to get to the potential buyer and, uh, and uh, persuade them that this is a good solution for them. So. Uh, mm-hmm. So then I have to in- increase the amount of time I had to spend on building uh, online presence and a brand. Uh, but, uh, and this is kind of a must if you're a, an author, a content content creator, uh, if you write books, if you, um, if you create educational materials, then this is what you have to do. Uh, so I don't really feel like I have a choice, uh, but if indeed, uh, if you are employed, uh, in a field where you're a specialist, uh, then you have a choice. And the question is, maybe it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, it's not worth your time to, to really hustle. Yeah. Time. Also, I think if, but if you're interested in building a presence, then I think go for it for sure. I, even if you're in medical communications, I think go, go for it. I mean, if you're freelancing as well, then it's, really important probably to have um, a, a presence online uh, but yeah I think with it's definitely if you're employed then I guess it's it's a we don't I don't feel the, the need to as much um, and I'm not the best at it I think <laughs> I don't know. I um, I mean, I like looking at them but I, I don't know if I'm the most the best at um, at I don't, I think I'm not as, I, I'm not as creative as you for sure. And I really like, you know, enjoyed reading and stuff or editing them, but I never thought that I could like write from scratch suddenly something that, <laughs> like you wrote. So it's definitely, um, it's, I think it's totally dependent on what you like and what you do. And I mean, but in I, either way, I think having an online presence as well as some marketing skill is like, is only gonna benefit yourself, right? In any way, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, uh, yes, but it, it eats so much time that you always yeah, that's afraid true. Afraid of right? What? How to to best spend your time? Because also, online presence is something that you cannot really drop out of. Because once you drop out yeah. and you stop creating, stop communicating, then mm-hmm. like you know everything you've built up to that point kind of kind mm-hmm. of slowly goes to the goes to dust. Um, so yeah. uh, even when you have a blog, you have to update the content once in a while because otherwise you get yeah. down, downgraded by Google. Um, so it's not something uh, you can suddenly, um, you know, start stop doing. Um, yeah. Anyways, uh, okay. Well, good to know. So that that's a good news actually. Uh, that means, <laughs> uh, there is a there is this uh, green island somewhere in the job market where you don't have to hustle. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> just, uh, peacefully work. <laughs> peacefully. Do I work. don't know. Maybe I'm just in the bottom, so maybe that's why. <laughs> but it's. I mean, it's. Yeah. It's. It's. Uh. It's like more time pressure than anything. I think. Um. When it comes to, 
what I do, I guess. Uh, but only, you know, maybe it's just within my little, little umbrella, I'm not sure. But there's definitely time pressure, but there's no pressure about um, online presence. <laughs> Well, that's what I dream of. Like, I dream of uh, finding my doppel doppelganger who would just go and hustle, <laughs> peacefully sit and write <laughs> instead. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, uh, maybe, maybe I, I get one one day. Maybe if you could also share what is the favorite uh, part of your job today. So, like you, you mentioned that you had to, you have to multitask. You have multiple types of duties. So what is what is your favorite part of the week? I think it's when you have a little bit of a social interaction as well as um, you know interesting work. And I, you know, started work during COVID, which means that we all started online, mm -hmm. right? So I think uh, it's hard to just go to the you know it's you, it's not like you can go to the kitchen and while you're making coffee you just chat with your colleague that doesn't happen so it's quite nice when you want to ask someone something and you call them and you end up chatting about just whatever it is like you know whatever even if it's like about the weather <laughs> so that's quite a nice um nice part of the job or like rather something that we have to it's it's a time that we have to create right nowadays when you can't just bump into people so when you have that accidentally you know and then you realize that you get along with that person that's always like a nice part of my day at least um but it's also quite nice to be able to be flexible in my work um, and you know I have to be thankful for the home office situation at the moment as well because my daughter goes to a child daycare that is just a, like around literally around the corner it takes me two seconds to get her for example so I can finish at three pick her up play with her until dinner and then I can work again for example if I need to so these these so the flexibility I definitely enjoy with my work, um, although there is time pressure and people respond very quickly. Things happen very quickly, actually, in medical communication. So you have to be very onto it. However, you do have the flexibility of choosing your time. Um, and that's that's a that's a really nice part of it as well. Um, and yeah, it's been quite interesting starting within a lockdown. Um, However, I think we are all trying to make the most of it. There is online events that we can participate in as well. So that's always a nice, um, a social aspect to the, to the work as well that we can, you know, try and bring during this online uh, mode <laughs> of work, yeah. Interesting. Um, I'm actually curious about the culture. Is it more, do you feel that it's more flat? that you uh, like communicate like on equal level or is it more yeah. like hierarchical that you have very clear deliverables and there is a clear there, there is a clear so we have line managers but it's extremely flat in that i mean they're definitely more senior and they have more experience but there but the whole aspect i think i when i started i was told or even before I started, I think during the interview, they were saying, oh, it's actually like, it's not meant to be hierarchical. You, you should be able to talk to anyone. Obviously there is a hierarchy because I think a company functions with a hierarchy, but it doesn't feel like it at all. And in Germany, you know, actually our common language is English because we have, um, you know, it's, it's, very, very, it's a very international company, but, uh, but in Germany, for example, there is, uh, two types of words to say you and one is Z and one is do and you know Z is like the formal form and when I was at uni you had to call the professors and you know people above you Z but here when I started they were like oh you, we don't use Z like we, we, we just don't have that hierarchy system and I think it's quite new age as well I think a lot of companies are doing that now which I like um, and you know even the the shops are doing that which is great i really appreciate it You're also coming from australia you know you never call your professor professor something it's just like oh hi chris you know whatever it is it's just very cash so i i come from that that atmosphere and i really like that casual atmosphere where you obviously you're going to have respect i think 
how you talk to them is not the way you you show your respect in i mean obviously you have to be polite or whatever like you know diplomatic and so on but i don't think calling people z versus do like that's not the show for me the sign of respect that i want to show so it, it was quite a nice uh, change um for me to not have such a hierarchical structure and to really really feel like you're working working in a collaborative team rather than oh you have to report this person or you know it, it was a it's just a really refreshing change um yeah yeah Great. And also, like, I think, yeah, generally that, uh, sorry, I, I'm just going to go back to your other other question about what I like about my job. But I, I do like creating something with people generally. So when you have, uh, when you then finish something that looks pretty in the end, and it's so visually or aesthetically pleasing, it's, it's a bit of an achievement, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, we, we've made something that is, it looks good, it, it, you know, it, it carries the message that you want it to carry. Um, and the also the nice part is that you get, you know, you get acknowledged for it. It's like, oh, you, you know, great job. Thank you so much for your work. And I think that's just a really nice thing that you may not get in um, academia as, as easily, I think, because mm -hmm. how many Eureka moments do you have? <laughs> yeah. um, great. Um... That, that that sounds that sounds great. And uh, if you uh, if you could give advice to um, PhD graduates and all the other young professionals who don't have formal experience with medical writing just yet, but come from medical sciences and are trying to get into the field, what do you think are the best entry points? I think if you have freelance experience, that's always always a great idea because then you have some experience, right? I mean, always language is always going to be an advantage, obviously. Um, but that's, that's something that potentially you can't help too much because you're never, you know, you can't be, you can be fluent at, at some a language because you live there, but you may not be classified as native, for example, I don't know, but uh, language is always, I think when it comes to medical communication is probably an, an advantage, but I think having experience is also always going to be an advantage, right? So if you have the chance to do some freelance work or just, just helping your friends edit their work, for example, um, you know, just going through their thesis or their manuscript or whatever, I think that's also just for yourself. I think it's good to know if you like that sort of thing. Um, and generally, I think knowing a little bit of knowing how to make something look pretty is always quite an, um, a nice, uh, nice thing um, to have. But, you know, that's that can also be learned as well. And but for me, what the advice really would be to follow your gut in a way. If you think that you want to. Like if you think you want to go in a different direction and if you want to try it, I feel like you should go for it because I, I think oh, you said actually that in um, that it's quite hard to pen penetrate, like the, this job market is hard to, hard to penetrate. But actually in Germany, it's not too bad, I think. So, well, it also really depends on where you are, I guess. So this is probably not the most, um, not the best, uh, not the best advice, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, but um, I mean, for example, I have a friend, when I started um, working here, I actually messaged my old supervisors from my PhD saying, oh, just letting you know that I swapped, I changed, uh, I changed my job. I no longer work at the university, but I work here. And one of them came back to me saying, oh, by the way, one of my, postdocs is actually wanting to also do medical communication and she's doing a master's in it so uh, apparently you can also do master's in um in it as well so i mean obviously having these experience or education is always going to be a plus for you um i think for me what helped was the experience that i got at um, OHBM, the Organization for Human Brain Mapping that was definitely a help for me um, and it also was helpful for my CV, I think, as well. Um, yeah, so I think just whatever you 
And, and who knew that during the OHBM experience that I would get an experience in this sort of, you know, editing or writing, but I did. So who knows what, what's there really? So I think if you have any chance to be involved in something other than just your academia, but something else on the side, then I think you should just go for it. But also I think you just have to follow your gut feeling and your heart when it comes down to it. I think you just have to do what, what you like. And um, I'm sure that if you persevere, which we're all very good at from academia, then you'll find a way, I think. Yeah, I think if, you, if, you, um, if you're fighting, you're, you already won. Like if, uh, yeah. The worst yeah. thing that can happen is uh, regretting things you didn't do. So, yeah, absolutely. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, and intuition is a very powerful uh, type of intelligence. In fact, mm. so, uh, it will always uh, it will like now. Actually, I also changed my way of making decisions uh, compared to five or ten or fifteen years ago. Mm -hmm. I used to be this logician, like the very logic person who always mm. took a lo logical arguments into account and. At some point, I realized that they, it only works in short term, but in the long term, I don't navigate myself well this way, uh, doing mm -hmm. only what my logical mind tells me. Mm -hmm. um, and w and going against intuition was uh, probably the worst decisions I ever I ever made. <laughs> but now you know, right? At least. Now I know. Now I know. Yeah. So if I... I always try to, when I make a decision, I always try to ask both my minds, my rational mind and my mm -hmm. intuitive mind. Mm -hmm. And if they disagree, then I go with the intuitive mind. Uh, oh, just, but that's very mind. good of you to, to know the difference in a way. Yeah, I, I, I see the difference. Well, the difference is that your gut is telling you something, so you, you feel yeah. it, you know, in your body. Yeah. Sort of. it's, uh, yeah. it's a bit different. Uh, it's hard. It's easy to tell the difference, I think. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Okay. And yeah. do you have any, do you, since, because like your story sounds like a happy, like a lucky escape, right? Like it's a, it's a <laughs> ending, you're happy. But is there anything that you would do differently if you had the chance? So if you look back at your career last five, ten years, uh, is there anything that you think, well, if I knew beforehand, like certain things, I would just do it differently? I wouldn't say so, because not because I regret anything like I mean obviously I've done things that I didn't like obviously you know and not all my my uh the places that I worked have been you know great obviously I think there's always going to be ups and downs within one project as well um you know within your PhD within your postdoc there's always going to be a high and a low however I think I sort of live by the rule where I want to make the most of what I have so whatever it is, I would want to make the most of what I have. So even if it's not the best situation, I would try and make the most, most of it. And if it's not working, then you always obviously have to find something else. And I think that's, that's probably why I pro sound like this too, that, um, you know, obviously it's not all shiny that's that's clear i think in academia as well as in industry it's not the best it's there's always going to be a negative side or there's always going to be stress there's always going to be pressure for something even though they're not comparable like they're not the same pressures or stress whatever but i think you know I, I i'm not saying that you have to be positive all the time because i think that's like that's stressful and it's probably not healthy for you. But I think to be self-aware and to, to really listen to what you are feeling and therefore like also follow your gut also, but, you know, think logically as well, but, you know, to really reflect on yourself and be self-aware and think about how you are feeling in that situation or in that at atmosphere. And if you try, if you've tried, and if it still doesn't work, then it's okay to change or it's okay to go somewhere else or whatever it is. So I think, yeah, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I've always had the, the, the best work atmosphere, but I've 
you know, I've, I've tried to make the most of it, I think. And if it didn't work, then that's okay. I just go somewhere else. And I think I really had to listen to how I'm feeling as well that, okay, like this is now not making me happy or this is, this is not going anywhere. Or it's like, okay, I, I'm, I have, I feel anxiety over this thing or something like that, you know? And then I've had to really learn to listen to my feelings um, and that's really made me aware of, you know, aware of how, how I want to lead my life, I guess. I want to do something that makes me happy, that I want that I'm passionate about. Medical communication is something that I'm passionate about and it's great, but most importantly, the people that I work with are really nice and that's what's that's what makes my life now really nice on top of you know all of like my family and everything like that but but just in terms of my profession that's what makes my life um nice now yeah perfect uh perfect okay uh great uh so on that note thank you so much ayaka for uh for joining us today and for your wonderful insights and for all of you guys who would like to get more uh, of this type of content, please subscribe to the channel. And we are uh, looking forward to your comments and questions. Please post them below and we'll answer each one of them. And till next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>